probably the most expensive video we've made to date. But we're not just gonna shoot this for, you know, a couple you know, days. A couple, you know, a couple. We're gonna go ahead and shoot 5,000 rounds, 5, rounds with this rifle. Uh, we're gonna be shooting this like you would the customer. We still couldn't get it to cycle properly. It was still overgassed. It was still super hard to shoot. It could be like a crack firing pin or something. I don't know. We're done for the day. So I just got off the phone with the CEO of Aero Precision. A very, very crucial part to the firearm broke again. 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 Over the years of producing YouTube videos on different kinds of rifles out there, there's always the question on every single video, what do you think about such, such and such a gun? Is this gun over here just as good as this gun over here? People are trying to uh, validate the purchases they've already made, or maybe they're trying to find a certain rifle to buy next, and they're trying to get some sort of information out there. And the problem with the firearms industry, and has been for a very long time, is there's very little objective data out there. Most of it's opinion-based. Uh, a lot of the stuff I put out is based on my opinion, based on my experiences with that hardware. It's not necessarily scientific testing, research, you know, crane-style stuff. And what we would like to do at T-Rex Arms is try to put out more objective data to people to make well-informed purchasing decisions. Now this video is a step in that direction, but this is not the final form. This is not what we think is going to be the most objective data out there, but this should be a little bit more helpful than a lot of other types of videos and reviews and articles and things that people put out. What we have right here is the Aero M5 E1 DMR AR-10 308 battle rifle AR gun thing. And we get asked a lot about this gun because a lot of folks are interested in getting into DMRs or maybe they want a battle rifle because they want to you know, be cool and they're doing jungle warfare and all that, but they want a rifle to start shooting out to 800 meters, maybe even 1,000 meters. And there's a lot of good DMR options out there, but they range from anywhere from $1,200 all the way up to $10,000, if not more. So this is a more budget option. They're around 1,400 bucks, 16 inch 308 stainless barrel. And so people ask, this gun, what about this one? So I thought, hey, let's buy one. You know, we're collecting all the DMRs out there and we're collecting some data and trying to figure out, you know, what's going on with 762 by 51 guns and even some 6.5 Creedmoors as well. And, uh, but we're not just gonna shoot this for, you know, a couple days. We're gonna go ahead and shoot 5,000 rounds with this rifle. We're gonna be filming every single drill that we're shooting. We're gonna be recording every single malfunction, every problem. We're gonna be checking groups every couple thousand rounds. And we're going to be shooting for the group tests uh, specifically, and also for some of our long range, taking the gun out to 700 meters. We're gonna be shooting three different uh, types of ammunition. We have our budget training ammo, well budget, I know some people are gonna freak out, but our budget training ammo, our Winchester M80, 149 grain ball ammo. We have sort of a middle of the, of the road, tier match ammo. We have the Hornady. This is the uh, Hornady 178 grain uh, boat tail hollow point. Nice ammo. It was like a buck 50 round. And then I thought, you know what? We need the high end, some sort of high end ammo to test through this gun to see how it handles really good ammo when you put, you know, put it through the gun. And I've got some Winchester M118s. Uh, this is 175 grain Sierra Match King boat tail hollow point service grade ammunition. And the more words you put on there, the more expensive it gets. So we're going to use the, the three different ammo here to test the accuracy of this weapon. Uh, we're going to do those group tests every 1,500, 2,000 rounds. We're going to be shooting this suppressed towards the end. We're going to be spray painting it. But the testing that we're doing for these 5,000 rounds, and we have a firing schedule to ensure that we actually get through these rounds. We're marking off, you know, when we have shot them and, you know, also what happens during that drill if something weird happens. But we're doing kind of a, an end user test 
So we're not just mag dumping this into trash and we're not just, you know, doing a rapid fire and then slow fire. Uh, we're gonna be shooting this like you would the customer. We're gonna be shooting drills. We're gonna be shooting close range stuff. Then we're gonna go shoot mid range, long range stuff. Uh, some will be rapid fire, some will be slower. Some the gun will be really hot cause it's a productive training day and I'm not gonna let it cool all the way before, you know, I start shooting it again. And that can affect barrel life and some of that other stuff out there. So we're trying to, test the rifle the way you guys would, or in our opinion, should be training with it. So, but again, whatever data we figure out from this, because we haven't, we haven't done this yet, we haven't shot the 5,000 rounds yet, uh, it is one data point, because it's only one gun. If we actually wanted really objective data, we would need 10 of these rifles. We would need a very rigorous testing schedule, possibly an environment testing like unit. There's a ton of stuff out there that we would need to do to actually put out real objective data. This is just one data point that you guys can use to make a decision on if this is a gun that you wanna buy. Maybe we experience some problems at 4,000 rounds. Maybe we don't, maybe the accuracy's crap. We don't know yet. Uh, I do wanna clarify, we have shot around 150 rounds through this gun already. I took this out and thought, you know, hey, I just wanna make sure the gun doesn't explode or do anything crazy. And it was before we kind of had this idea anyway to do 5,000 rounds. So it does have 150-ish rounds through it of the M80 ball. Uh, some of it was suppressed, some of it was unsuppressed. So the gun hasn't exploded yet. It's not fresh out of the box, but we haven't cleaned it. Uh, we haven't done any major modifications except for putting a Surefire three prong on the gun. We are going to keep it stock. We're not gonna you know, swap out the rail. We're not gonna swap out you know, a bunch of other stuff, the buffer tube, the springs and everything else, you know, something catastrophic happens. We're gonna try to leave the gun as stock as possible, how Aero puts it together. And we're mainly just gonna layer on different attachments and different accessories. Now, some of you guys may notice that the optics we're putting on this gun are not budget matched to the rifle. And the reason for this is I want to try to remove some of those other variables from you know, testing the rifle, like getting hits at distance and stuff. So I'm going to be using mid-range and higher-end optics to do that. Plus, in my opinion, if you are building out a DMR rifle, or really a rifle in general, you probably want to spend a little bit of coin on the thing that you literally use to hit targets, that you literally use to see targets. Buying a $1,200 rifle and going, well, what $200 scope can I buy? You know, one to 10 scope or whatever. Not the best course of action in my opinion. I think you should try to pony up and buy a decent scope and with optics, you typically pay for what you get. So we have some Night Force options, some of the more cheaper but Night Force options. We've got the SIG M110A1 scope that the Army is going to for the DMR, which is somewhat fitting for this gun. And then we have the Voodoo one to 10 as well, plus some magnifier options. So they're all like mid-range high-end optics, but that's probably what people should be doing, especially on DMR rifles and not trying to skimp out as much as possible in order to hit out to 800 meters. It's just not a very good idea, in my opinion. So there's one important note about this particular rifle. When we went to purchase this a few months back, we, we, we do this often with stuff here in the armory, we purchased the upper uh, anonymously. We did not buy this through T-Rex Arms because that is a way of potentially getting a uh, nicer, product, you know, optic or a rifle uh, picked off the line. If a company, because I know this has happened, sees, oh, it's going to T-Rex Arms. Oh, it's probably being used in YouTube. Let's double, triple check that this product is actually going to be uh, a, a, a good one for them. I'm not saying that Arrow does that, but there are companies in the industry that absolutely give nicer versions of their product to influencers, YouTubers, bloggers, whatnot. So if you are someone who is trying to review product, um, try to buy it anonymously. Try to go buy it, you know, off of gun broker or something like that versus straight from the manufacturer with your you, YouTuber name, your celebrity name, your celebrity company or whatever. Uh, try to do that anonymously if you can. So we bought the upper anonymously. One of the customer service guys uh, made that happen. The lower, uh, it's a lower. It obviously has some parts in it. We had that shipped to our FFL. So they knew the lower was going to T-Rex arms, but the upper, which is really where the main uh, stuff is going to be happening. Um, we purchased that anonymously, didn't get it for free so that hopefully this is, you know, what you guys may actually, you know, buy if this is something that you actually go out and get. Uh, the first build that we're going to do, the first like 800, 900 rounds we're going to be shooting, I'm going to be building this out in sort of a, a, a battle rifle format. So we're not running a scope. Uh, we're not running, you know, suppression on it. We're just going to be running an EOTech. We have a couple magnifier options to take it out to five, 600 meters. And we're just going to run and gun with this. I am going to remove the PRS stock just because this length of pull, not great if I'm running a red dot, a uh, little bit better if I'm running 
certain you know scopes and stuff so we're going to convert over to a carbine stock and that's something i really like about this uh, magpul uh, prs light whatever it's called stock that comes on uh, one of their lower offerings on their site you can actually remove the whole thing it's not like part of the buffer tube and there's a standard uh, carbine buffer tube underneath to then receive you know your normal collapsing stocks so that's something i really like about the lower uh, i think the lower was like $450 uh, completed and then the upper was like 800 or whatever it is so the whole gun comes out to be like 1250 something like that so let's build the sucker out We just finished zeroing the rifle with the EOTech, and now what we're gonna do, this is our first group test of this 5,000 rounds. We are gonna shoot two five round groups with each of the ammo that we have. We're using a lead sled to remove some of the human input, human error into the gun. Uh, so we're gonna have um, as precise of a group as we can with the stuff that we have here. Um, but we're gonna do the M80, you know, two five round groups with that, the Hornady and the uh, Winchester M118s and uh, see what's going on. We don't have a cold bore shot on this because I just got the gun hot, zeroing it. Uh, so this is gonna be with the gun in its uh, already shot form. So we're gonna find out exactly what kind of MOA we're getting with this gun, unsuppressed, uh, with these three types of ammo. All right, so we just finished lead sledding first group with this weapon and the first gun the first ammo that we were shooting is the m80 and uh a little terrifying in some ways but what we have right here this is cheap training ammo cheap training ammo it's like 60 cents around we have uh pretty much like a three three and a half four moa uh with this ammo out of this gun right here so when i take this and start shooting out to 500 that's going to be a 20 inch group that's just uncontrollable uh based outside of the variable I put into the gun and the wind and all that um, because it is cheaper ammo being shot out of this uh, most likely cheaper rifle uh, but then once we started shooting you know some of the more uh, Gucci ammo uh, the group started to tighten up and so what we have here is like a one and a half ish MOA group with the Hornady ammo it opened up a little bit on one of the groups we have a little bit of wind we are using a lead sled yes there are some other variables that can potentially creep in but we're eliminating as many of them as possible but we can see with better ammo we're getting getting better uh, precision out of the weapon or better groups at least then when we went to shoot the m118s uh, really gucci high-end ammo uh, two dollars and fifty cents around is what i paid for this uh, we could see with the right conditions and everything we can get rounds actually touching with like a one moa group so hey this gun is capable with the right ammo with the right stuff done getting really good groups shooting really expensive ammo so it is possible and then we have one group over here it's a little bit a little bit larger but it's like you know one and a half moa something like that and so a lot of folks out there you know they think that their rifle has to be sub moa one moa and a lot of that's dependent on the ammo that you're shooting anyway and a lot of these guns out there aren't precision rifles this just isn't that this is more like a battle rifle like what is actually a reasonable moa to expect out of a gun like this so we're gonna be shooting M80 for the majority of this range day, putting 700 rounds-ish on this gun, including some stuff at distance, and we'll see just how hard it is to land hits on targets at four or 500 meters with this type of MOA, a four or five MOA with this ammo. And yeah, it's gonna to be tougher. It's gonna to be a lot harder. Um, so it is something to understand, but we're gonna be grouping these ammos at 100 yards again, uh, 1, 000, 1,500 rounds in. We're gonna add a suppressor, do it suppressed and unsuppressed and see what happens. And maybe we'll see these groups get much larger at the end of the 5,000 rounds. Um, who knows? We don't know because we haven't gotten there yet. So let's go ahead and check this gun out to 500 meters, see what it does with this ammo right here. And then we're gonna get into closer range drills. All right, first target is 165 yards. So it's like 150 meters, 40 something. Shooting it through a little bit of brush. That's a hit. hit. Moving down, we have a target at 297 yards, 296. Right side. 
So the reduced seat zone at 290, rounds are all around it. I'm holding center, I was holding head box because I was going low, obviously it's 300 meters. And I had soft left and right, and then landed like one hit. Then went to 500, once again, the rounds are kind of landing either side. Once I got, once I held high enough for that distance uh, with the CEO tech, I uh, did land a hit, but this ammo is definitely gonna make shooting distance with this gun very difficult. Even if you're bagged, prone, solid trigger press, holding at the right spot, it's a crap shoot based on the ammo. Um, it'll be interesting once we run a one of the night force scopes and we shoot that good ammo to see really what this gun will do. But uh, I don't have really high hopes for uh, shooting really good timed courses of fire uh, out to 500, especially not prone like on barricades and stuff. It's just gonna be very difficult. But let's go shoot up close and put some rounds on this gun. We've had our first malfunction at 400, oh, plus the 150 I shot earlier before. Correct. Round 400 rounds, our first malfunction. I believe it is mag related. I've had some bad experience with these old, uh, what are these, DPMS mags? I don't know what these are. Um, when I was shooting these with the uh, RSAS, I had some similar issues. So I'm gonna chalk it up to a mag problem, but we are gonna put it down on paper. It's a round that is trying to go in, that is snagging. Uh, friction wise with the magazine so if I lock the bolt to the rear pressure has now been relieved the round is loose there we go most likely mag not gun so this magazine let's go ahead I will shoot these two bullets though for a round count let us check that or mark it that we've had one problem with that mag, so tape or something. And I'll just chalk up these two rounds to this mag. So we just finished shooting 50 rounds at 500 meters. A bunch of it prone, some of it timed, some off of this barrier. And uh, it was very hard to get good hits with this M80 ammo, but also with this combination right here. Now with other setups, you know, 556 five, guns and whatnot, EOTech with G45, money run it quite a bit out to 500 uh, but with this ammo and this gun I have so much drop off that I don't really have a reference point inside of the EOTech I have my main ring like this center dot but I'm holding so high like two feet high two and a half feet high that there's no reference point between center dot and the the ring you know the 68 65 MOA ring that I can really consistently aim at and there's no consistent point in the tree line to come back to because it's all in shadow and stuff over there that there's a lot of sort of guessing going on is like am I just high enough am I just low enough and so rounds are impacting all around we did get some hits but we didn't get five consecutive which is what I, look, was what I was looking for five consecutive hits at 500 meters prone bipodded off a barrier um, with this ammo with this gun with this optic setup could it be me absolutely it could be me uh, but landing five hits with this with this setup is going to be very difficult with this ammo if I'm shooting the Lake City uh, You know the M118s or the Hornady it will probably be easier and we'll be finding that out in uh, other builds of this gun uh, when we get to that ammo to find out what's going on at 500 meters
So that's shooting doubles with this rifle, which I've never done with a DMR. And uh, first, it's two shots as fast as you, you can pull the trigger with one sight picture. It's a great way of checking your recoil management and what's going on. These are all my first shots where I'm like, good, you know, good to go. Second shot comes up, comes up, comes up, comes up. Like the other one was out here. Very difficult with this rifle. That's at 15 meters. This is 25. So same thing. This is all first shot. Second, second. Not even on paper for the second follow-up shot. Same thing. These are my shots with the gun settled. Good side picture. And then my second shot, it is left, right, high. We have one on paper. Yeah, this gun is moving a lot. Five Charlie. We're good. Four Charlie center, all scored. Oh, yeah. Eight points, good. Uh, this is 15. We're good, 16 on this one. Oh yeah, I'm good, okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Charlie on right, all scored. That's not bad. 207, three Charlie. Nice. So that's five round groups at, that was at 40 meters in a 285. So pretty, pretty fast, pretty quick considering this is a 308 with a flash rider. Definitely uh, learning how to control this sucker with time. 
going to be awesome at recoil management with a 556 that I'm done. One, two, because those weren't there earlier. We already had those four. So, those four. So, we're good. Two Charlie on two targets with a 308 DMR battle rifle and a 221. So, first shot um, from the high ready is a 6 4, 1 5 split mil spec trigger. 1 6, a 1 4, a 1 6, a 3 3 transition, a 1 6 split, a 1 6 split, a 1 6 split, a 1 5 split. Not bad. right there. So we're back in the armory. We're going to be reconfiguring this rifle into something that might be a little bit more applicable for how you might be building out an AR-10. So we just finished shooting it in this sort of battle rifle configuration with a red dot, backup irons, uh, pretty straightforward build, and then also using a magnifier a little bit. But now we're gonna transition into a dedicated magnified optic. And in that case, we have this EOTech Voodoo 1-10. to This is a newer scope on the market, first focal plane, 34 millimeter tube. Um, Pretty standard, uh, you can shoot it on 1x fairly easily, go all the way up to 10, which makes it a little bit easier for shooting uh, further distances than a 5x magnifier and a red dot. I've also used this a uh, little bit on the SCAR 17 that we have here in the armory. Uh, the optic held up just fine, didn't get fried, and so we're gonna be using it on this rifle right here. So it'll be kinda nice to compare you know, the performance of shooting that SCAR with this exact op optic, and then also looking at it uh, with this particular rifle. There's a couple other little things I'm gonna be doing. Uh, I'm gonna be adding an M-Lock section to the bottom to support this Atlas bipod that has a built-in uh, ADM mount, something that's just a little bit more sturdy, also a little more expensive than a Harris bipod. Harris's are great, but they are a little bit lighter and can jump around as you're shooting in the uh, prone position a little bit more. Uh, because this is, uh, you know, we're not going to be running an offset red dot with this particular scope. I could, but in this case, I'm not going to. I'm actually going to be running a set of backup irons because I do want some sort of backup system, if I can, on this weapon. So I have a set of Magpul Inbus Pro offsets. They're not too bad. I would rather have a red dot, but in this case, we're going to, you know, imagine we put the money into the scope, had a little bit left over for iron sights and not a full red dot. And I'm also going to be changing out the grip uh, to something a little bit more straight. This is the BCM. It's one of my favorites out there. Uh, just a little bit uh, less uh, steep of an angle. Uh, well, not, not as angled like an A2, kind of like on this uh, Magpul right here. It's just a little bit more comfortable for holding the rifle up and then also not getting all kinds of crazy blisters and stuff uh, that I was getting with this grip. But, you know, yeah, it is what it is. So we're going to go ahead and uh, build this gun out and see how this 1 to 10 fares on the range uh, on this particular rifle for another 800 or so rounds.
one of the issues we've been running into uh, in shooting off of our firing schedule is the gun getting quite hot. It's also pretty warm out. It's about 80 something degrees right now. It's gonna get hotter. And uh, so what we're doing for this range day on day two is we have this nice big Pelican full of ice. So we're just gonna throw the gun in there uh, whenever it gets fairly hot. We temp, we laser temped the gas block and it was 195 degrees. Uh, we did not temp the rail, but it is uh, at that, you know, um, temperature where it's, I can hold on to it for maybe one more magazine before it gets unbearable and I have to swap to a glove. So whenever we get to, too hot to hang on to without going to a glove. We're just gonna throw it in here for a minute or two, you know, get our mags ready and do everything else. Um, so we will be, it won't be, I don't think it's going to be a sharp change in temperature that's going to affect the weapon, but it is, this is worth uh, noting and showing for some of you nerds who are interested in that kind of thing. So we'll just lay it on top. May have to get rid of some ice, actually. Kind of carve a little spot for it. There we go. Nice, nice. Um, it will get wet because this these aren't ice packs, but whatever. And then uh, we'll just, you know, let it simmer in there. All right, so two minutes inside the ice bath. Yeah, it feels a lot better. But the real moment of truth. Oh, wow, yeah, it's like perfect. 132 for the gas block. Get a few different readings, 120, 135, 60 degrees down, and it's easy to hold on to now. Nice, nice, and it's not wet at all. All right, so at 10, 12 meters-ish, these are mostly my first shots. This is the recoil coming up every single time. Uh, it is very hard to see a second side picture with this particular reticle uh, in the Voodoo 1 to 10. The illumination isn't, really noticeable right now but not bad it's all on all 20 going back to 25 meters once again these are my first shots recoil goes up we have three in the head that's a double two off to the left we're missing five on uh, on paper they're way up here guns jumping up that 40 oh oof. we should have one two three 13 seven off which means three of the second shot second side picture recoil management controlling and everything are on paper it's probably these three right here and the rest are all these are all the single shots first shots so yeah 40 meters once again with this gun doing doubles with that recoil with the flash hider very hard to keep it on a single target pulling the trigger as fast as possible with one side picture One, two, three, four, four Charlie on left. We're good, one, ha, two Charlie. Oh, the head box at the 25 on 6X it was so fast, it was just, um, and that's, uh, I'll count that as a name, shooting 308. Um, one, two, uh, three Charlie. So we're about 1,300 rounds in, and this is something that I just noticed pulling the gun out of the ice box. Uh, what Arrow does is, so I'm being told, is they use set screws instead of roll pins uh, for things like their uh, bolt bolt catch, bolt release, bolt hold open, uh, the forward assist right here, and I have this one for the bolt release uh, that is starting to come un unscrewed. So that's not great. I'm going to tighten it up. We're going to pay attention to it, but we're about 1,400 rounds in. If that comes out all the way things start to fall out, so that's kind of a problem. So we're just gonna go in here. Uh, technically, I could Loctite it, then do it. I'm just gonna put it in, and we're gonna pay attention to it, watch it, see what happens, but that's kind of unfortunate. 
with this much, well, two full shooting days. Um, so it is what it is. Function with this magazine. All right, so as you can see, let me get in here. We have failure to feed. Bullet is just barely going in. It's just not coming up fast enough from this mag. Probably springs wearing out. Bolt's starting to close before the bullet the bullet's even up at the top of the magazine. We've already had issues with these magazines. So I'm not going to call it a gun issue, and it usually happens at the end of these cheap DSA mags or whatever these are. We're about 300 rounds since talking about this earlier and the uh, small set screw for the bolt release is coming out again. So we're gonna tighten it down, but unfortunately it's probably like 500 rounds and this thing is out and gone and this is gonna fall out. So we're gonna lock tight it next time we go to the armory. Um, definitely something to watch for. And uh, this one is um, obviously with Gravity isn't affecting this one quite as much because it's facing upwards shouldn't be a problem here But um, this one on the side as I'm uh, Manipulating the bolt release and as it's being used I guess is causing this to fall out plus the recoil of the 7.62 so um, Definitely something to watch for on your arrow if you buy one of these and we're gonna go ahead and lock tight this and shove it back in there um, Once we're back at the armory so second time this has come out All right, so we just finished day two. We shot 828 rounds, uh, mostly our M80, our training ammo, our Winchester M80. We also shot some Hornady to check some stuff at distance at the end of the day. I wish I'd done that earlier before I was fully smoked, um, but overall, gun has run great so far. Uh, now we're going to paint it and build it out in another configuration and uh and see what's going on but um i'm pretty happy with uh, how things are going so far shooting distance is definitely easier with a scope like the voodoo one to ten compared to a red dot with a magnifier it can be done with a red dot and a magnifier don't you know uh for sure but this just makes it a little bit easier the glass clarity is just a lot clearer it's not as many panes of glass that you're stacking and it goes to 10 instead of just a 5 with the g45 so um this is a very nice build uh, sort of a, a loadout uh for a 16 inch 308 i like this scope a lot um it's one of the better one to eight one to ten one to eight type sort of scope options on the market as far as a first focal goes and so i really like it and um it worked well on this gun and i've shot this on the scar and some other stuff 
and uh, it's definitely a potent. A few things that I want to do to this gun though to make it a little bit better, a little bit easier to shoot. Um, I want to lube it at some point. We're still running it dry to see when it starts to choke. That will make just everything, working the charging handle and everything a whole lot easier. Um, I want to swap the charging handle to something like a Radian, something with a little bit more surface area. I want to add a, sl a sling point right here for when I start getting into um, you know, a little, a little faster shooting, easier manipulation of the weapon, you know, high ready, stuff like that. Uh, swings level here. Uh, this stock was great for today. Uh, having a dedicated PRS style stock would definitely help. I do like the uh, locking aspect to the CTR um, so that that eliminates um, a lot of the play in the stock. If you are considering running this as a, you know, battle rifle type stock build, where you can collapse it down all the way for transport and stuff like that. And um, those are the main changes I really wanna make. If I could do a bad lover, I would love that. Um, we're gonna swap the trigger, that would be nice too. So there's a few little things that we can do to the gun that will make shooting it a little bit easier. And I think we will see, I know I will see benefit in, in, in just manipulating the weapon on some of these drills and changing the trigger uh, should also eliminate a little bit of room for air once we start taking the gun out to 600 meters, which we did today back there on the little rooftop thing. So uh, pretty awesome. I'm looking forward to day three. So for the next 1500 or so rounds, we're gonna be running the rifle in this configuration. First off, we decided to paint a single layer of paint uh, on this weapon. We are gonna be painting it again uh, when we move to some other optics. But this is the, because I know you all will ask, uh, the Team Wendy. Uh, special spray paint that they have for uh, touching up helmets, which I find really interesting. But it's a nice peanut butter coyote brown. It's very similar to the LWRC color. So it does look very uh, factory, unlike some of the other spray paint uh, on the market. So that's what is giving this rifle its uh, peanut butter look right now. There is another thing that we did change. Uh, Radian was so kind as to send a couple AR-10 charging handles. Uh, we, sell, we sell these, I have bought many, but they sent these in for free. I like buying things, but whatever. Uh, we have both the SD and the standard. We're gonna be shooting with the standard charging handle, kind of like I mentioned earlier. I get a little bit more surface area on here, especially working this much more stiff uh, bolt recoil spring, everything going on. Having that extra surface area is going to be really nice. When we start running suppressed, uh, which will be in about, uh, again, about 1500 rounds, um, then we'll actually move between the SD and the standard and see what kind of a difference uh, we're getting out of that. I haven't used the SD charge handle in an AR-10. I've used it a lot in like 300 blackouts and stuff like that. So that'll be interesting. Uh, we still haven't lubed the bolt. We haven't changed the trigger. Um, there's nothing really else that we have changed to the weapon. All we've done is accessorize it. And what we have for that, I've added a PEC-15. This may come off um, a little bit. We use it a little bit, comes off a little bit, just add some extra weight to the gun, kind of see what's going on. Um, if I were running around with night vision, I would definitely want a laser of some sort. Uh, also have a Surefire Vampire Pro, so it's uh, tilted up against the PEC so that my hand can easily get up there and activate it. Uh, but the main uh, change to the rifle is the optic. And in this case, we have the SIG Tango 6T, first focal plane, 762 reticle, one to six scope. Now what's interesting about this scope is this is the same scope that is going on the Army Issue uh, 417 M110A1 uh, rifle, so, which is also a 16 inch uh, 308 gun. So we have something that is uh, very similar incomparable. It's obviously a $1,200 gun as opposed to a $5,000 gun. Uh, so it'll be fun to kind of run the same optic on the same build and see what can happen. And those of you watching this who maybe have a time on that gun uh, can see some of the drills, see some of the hits that we're doing, and you'll be able to identify like, oh, okay, yeah, that's what we're doing with our M110A1s. And this is what he's doing with this budget gun with the same optic. So it'll be fun. It'll be interesting. But I'm going to be shooting it a lot on 1X since that is kind of the purpose of an LPVO or is the supposed purpose of an LPVO. And then going up to 6X and shooting out to 600 meters, 700 meters potentially, and that's going to be a lot of fun. So still running it in sort of a battle rifle configuration. We're not doing a massive magnified scope on it quite yet. And I can still run the bipod when I need to. And uh, yeah, let's go see how it does. All right, so I think this is day three or day four, something like that. 
and we have the rifle in its new configuration and we just finished zeroing the Tango 6T and doing some uh, more group tests. Now this is at about 15, 80 rounds, something like that, so at like 1500, and we did the exact same thing that we did at the very beginning. We shot two five round groups with the uh, Winchester M80, two five round groups with the Hornady, and then two five round groups with the uh, Lake City M118s. Um, the groups are still pretty consistent. The M80 looks like it's a four and a half ish. Uh, four MOA group out of this gun at 100 meters and that's in a lead sled with a couple of sandbags There's still you know potentially a little bit of human error, but it's less than just being off of a bipod um, The, the uh, Hornady 178 grain um, is still producing. I mean on this one. It's producing like a two and a half um, Which is pretty consistent with the last group we did at the very beginning and then the Lake City is actually not quite as tight or doesn't look quite as tight as the first groups that we did I don't think the barrel is starting to get degraded yet, um, but it is something to definitely watch for. But you can see a pretty stark difference in this ammo right here that costs a lot of money and um, uh, the ammo over here that, that does it really. So, um, but we're gonna keep shooting it. We're gonna keep seeing what's going on. We're gonna keep watching the groups. We're gonna compare them all and see what happens um, as we get this gun closer to 5,000 rounds. But uh, we're primarily gonna be shooting M80 today. It's sort of our training ammo or close range stuff. And then when we start going to the further distances, we're gonna mix it up with some of the, the nicer ammo um, to eliminate some of that room for error. So we are now at 2186 rounds, 2186 rounds fired through this rifle and we have noticed a thing that is happening to it. When I first uh, got this rifle out, I witness marked the uh, screws holding the handguard to the barrel nut and they didn't move back when I was done shooting 1500 rounds with the EOTech and the Voodoo 1 to 10. I painted the gun, re-witness marked them and I am now starting to see them shift. Um, so we can see the mark there of where this little blue needs to be lined up and it has moved over. So what this means is the handguard is starting to slowly loosen and eventually it will start to do a little bit of twisty twisty. My laser will go on zero if it were uh, zero to begin with, which it's not. And um, yeah, problems begin to occur. And we're only at 2100 rounds. Uh, we haven't dropped the rifle. Um, I have torqued, you know, M-lock slots and other accessories to it, uh, but we haven't done anything to the rail like with abuse, um, all we've done is just shoot it a lot, a lot of bullets. So uh, good to note um, the little screw for this. I just checked it. I, I just remembered. Oh, we need to check that too. Um, that thing is fine, um, but we are starting to see. You can see it here as well that it is starting to um, turn. So um, that was one reason uh, we didn't want to swap the rail to a. I have a Samson quad rail I want to use eventually, um, but we're not swapping to that because we want to see how well this handguard holds up based on how arrow puts it together so um good to note and uh we'll keep shooting this the rest of the day see what happens and then we'll tighten it down um when uh, the need arrives
Uh-oh. Uh-oh. There was a bullet in the chamber and I pulled the trigger. It did not fire. The gun did not go off. Um, there it is. We will wait a second to see if it explodes next to me. There's no detent. There's, there's nothing? Bolt didn't close, it's super dirty. All right, so we're at 23, 36 rounds, and we are now starting to get just some pretty standard choking of the weapon. Um, not necessarily a fault of the rifle itself, just we haven't lubed it at all for 2,300 rounds. Um, like, didn't lube it at all when we got it. Uh, it had whatever factory grease and stuff was on it, and we have been shooting it, and it is, um, I mean, there's like very little coming off my hand with it dry. So we're gonna go ahead and lube it up with some uh, LG Go Juice, wipe off excess, uh, throw it back in the gun, just like, you know, um, I don't want to wipe it off personally, but you know, other people think we should. I just want to lube it and keep going. But um, but we're gonna go ahead and wipe it off a little bit, and uh, and then see like, once this is a little bit wet, we should be able to see a little a little better what's going on with it. It's not bad. It's not horrible. All right, that looks a little better. Definitely some stuff going on, but that's you know shooting. So we're just gonna lube a couple places, drop it in, and then I'm probably gonna lube a little bit more. It also as dry as a bone. One thing I like to do is sometimes you'll get a spring in a rifle that feels really uh, dry and sort of gritty. And so one thing I actually have found is uh, I just lube this spring. Um, it, it's always worked for me. Maybe you know some guy out there will probably say, you know, you're not supposed to. Um, but I'm gonna go ahead and do that right now because it's kind of got that, that tangy sproing going on right now that I want to get rid of. So I literally just dribble a couple passes and it just gets out into the buffer and then just solves the problem. Yeah, see there we go. That, that sproing is gone. So we're done with this configuration uh, of the Arrow rifle and we have a round count that is uh, up to 2,564 rounds. So we're a little over halfway there. And uh, this video has been pretty tough to film just for that reason. Um, and I, now I know why other people don't do this. But uh, I've spent a lot of time on this particular scope. Um, this configuration, you know, I'm, I'm kind of sort of mimicking the, the new M10A1 sort of rifle. Um, sort of that intermediate bow rifle kind of DMR gun and uh, I've spent quite a bit of time on this scope on a lot of different guns prior to this and um, Just there's a couple things that kind of get got confirmed for me using this uh, I'm not a huge fan of the scope on 1x It's a great optic on six power when you have the entire reticle that you've zoomed into because it is the first focal plane of optic uh, But on 1x it's actually harder to use I found harder to use on some of the drills I was shooting uh, than the voodoo 1 to 10 uh, the thing about the voodoo 1 to 10 that I really liked and it's cool just having a stark Comparison between both uh, back to back is that center bullseye ring uh, helps dry, uh, draw the eye to the center 
Well, with the Tango 6T, what you have are big crosshairs along the side and on the bottom, which you saw through our uh, trigger cam uh, little setup. Um, but it doesn't draw the eye to the center like the Voodoo 1 to 10 does. So um, I prefer the Voodoo 1 to 10 on a 1X for a 1X type scope, which I never thought I would say that. Um, I always thought like a 1 to 6 dedicated, you know, gun uh, scope would be better. Um, but I actually like the Voodoo more for that. That's a good scope though. I mean, we shot this gun with the uh, Lake City ammo uh, at 600. We had five consecutive hits and I'm just, I'm drilling the target. Um, all the long range or mid range, whatever you want to call it that I'm doing, uh, I, I'm kind of sending it. I'm trying to take shots as soon as my reticle, you know, my mill that I'm holding on lands on the target, I'm pressing the trigger. I'm not taking a bunch of extra time. I'm not taking a breath. I'm not doing any of that. I'm seeing how fast I can shoot this gun uh, like one round a second and see what kind of hits I can land. And I'm trying to do that consistently over all three ammos um, in the different positions and different things that I'm doing. Uh, when we uh, build this gun out with the Night Force 2 to 20 and we throw a suppressor on there and some other stuff, we'll start to get a little more, uh, you know, we'll go a little more precision-y if we can uh, with this gun, which may not be possible, but we'll see. Uh, but so far it's been uh, handling uh, things pretty well. Uh, we did lube it up finally, uh, thank goodness. I'm really glad we did. And uh, the rail continues to get looser. Um, so that's a bit of a problem. The uh, detent or the uh, the bolt catch, a uh, little screw right here, that hasn't moved anymore. That's cool. Um, I hate the trigger, mil spec trigger with this gun. Not a huge fan. Definitely want to change that out. Uh, but we will we'll keep shooting and uh, see what happens with this rifle. But that is this configuration that is finished. And now it's on to the next. Got a light strike of some sort. Could be the magazine. Gun is still decently lubed. Or no strike at all. No strike. No strike. That was off of a full bag of Lancer, but it's chambering, pressing. Nothing. I don't think it's the mag. Could be. Something. Two in a row, not pull, not trigger, not send, hitting the primer, or hitting the, the striker, not hitting the uh, firing, pin. firing pin. It could be like a cracked firing pin or something. I don't know. What do you think we should do? I think we should pull the bolt out and inspect everything. Yeah, I'm literally pushed all the way in. My job is done. Extractor looks yes. Good. Your firing pin broke, dude. <laughs> I knew it. I didn't actually know that, but you know, yeah. one shot. I fired one shot and then literally click, racked it out. There was chance. no strike. There's a good chance that it's in either your upper or your lower at the moment. We're done. <laughs> We're finished. Hold on. Here's a question, though. You need to ask at what point you consider a catastrophic failure. We're not talking. Get your multi-tool out and fix it. Oh yeah, this is like We're talking, your guns down, down. Oh, dude, you need to go. Your order a new part if you can. The gun is it's it's not like it's a fixable problem at this point with the tools that you have on you. We have a lot of extra kit out here. The only thing that would, that would do would be a spare bolt. You just drop a whole bolt in. Uh, people will blame it on the spray paint. There's no spray paint on this, so it's not the spray paint. We're done for the day. So we're right now at 2,565 rounds fired uh, through the arrow, and we have had our first, and possibly only, uh, catastrophic failure uh, of this weapon, and that is the firing pin uh, tip breaking off. What happened this morning, I got down to zero the rifle, literally it was 9.30 or something. We, we were supposed to have a full shoot day. Get down prone, fire that single shot into the target. 
Second shot, nothing. I figure who knows what it could be. I load up another round, doesn't fire either. We opened the gun and saw that the firing pin was not even uh, protruding uh, through the bolt um, on the rifle. And then when we pulled it out to inspect, we saw, oh, it's not there anymore. This is a pretty catastrophic uh, failure. Uh, this means that you're not gonna be able to you know, get your gun back up and running if you were in the field, unless you carry uh, spare parts or a spare bolt carrier group, your gun is just uh, done. It's not gonna shoot. Like in that scene in Shooter where he picks up his JTAC and tries to shoot the guy in that office. Hey, free my hands, please. Put that weapon down. I swapped all the firing pins before I left the house. I always do. Looks right, need a micrometer to tell but the gun don't shoot. So there's a couple things uh, to consider with this. Going back to what we talked about originally, this is not a super thorough test of this rifle. If we wanted to do a thorough torture test of this gun, we would need multiple samples. We probably, I'd wanna do 10, just so we have like a decent percent of what's going on. Uh, but this is a data point that a lot of people uh, may not get to based on how little they shoot their arrow. And I say this because we've been talking about this video on social media, and I've seen a lot of comments from people saying, wow, we're really looking forward to seeing the results of you guys actually shooting 5,000 rounds through the rifle because I've only shot 300. I've only shot 200. I've only shot 600. And it's possible that they'll run into issues uh, such as this one once they get their rifle to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 rounds. Do we know for sure? No, because this is only one case where this has actually occurred. But this is pretty bad. Um, in the 10 years that I've been shooting rifles, I have never broken, shattered, fractured, or at least not that I know of on the fractured part or whatever, uh, a firing pin in a rifle. Whether it's a 5.56 gun, whether it's 308, I haven't ever had a gun just go down on me that hard uh, because of the firing pin. And maybe it's because 7.62 guns are more harsh, they're more violent, this is something that happens more often. I'm not sure about that. Some of you guys might be able to speak to that. But even just shooting other 308 guns over the last few years, my SCAR and other guns like that, again, haven't had any issues. This is the first. So that's definitely something to uh, take into consideration. Now, some of you guys may surmise a couple things. First, you may say, well, it's because you painted the gun twice. No, the paint hasn't gotten down to the firing pin or even into the bullet carrier group. But then the second one is, well, you're also throwing the rifle into a bucket full of ice uh, whenever the gun starts to overheat because it's 100 degrees out. We thought about this one a lot. Yes, we're putting the gun on ice in a non-insulated Pelican to cool it down a little bit faster so we can actually shoot 800 rounds in a day because when it's 100 degrees out, these guns heat up really fast. Um, we also don't want to shoot the gun to high heat uh, the entire time because that's a whole nother you know, level of harshness we're subjecting the weapon to, just like if we put this in a freezer or if we use like dry ice or liquid nitrogen or some other crazy stuff like that. And we're not doing that. We're putting it on top of ice. And even when I go to pick the gun up, it's still generally warm. There's not enough, in our opinion, uh, temperature change there that's actually going to affect the metallurgy of everything on the gun, especially not the firing pin that's protected by the upper receiver, that's protected by this giant bolt carrier group, and then inside is the firing pin itself. So we don't believe the ice is what caused this break right here. It's uh, most likely other things. And it's interesting to note that we haven't even gotten to shooting suppressed yet, where we would actually see more violent just beatings happening to this gun. Uh, we're supposed to get there very shortly, um, but we've had a break uh, just doing normal shooting activities, rapid fire here and there. Again, it's sort of a customer test. It's kind of the drills that you guys may be doing with this gun. Some slow fire, long range, some rapid fire, but we're not doing anything that even in the realm of torture testing for this thing to break. We're not shooting this full auto. We're not shooting it to the point of the gun catching on fire, like one of those weird like Kalashnikov videos. Uh, we're not doing that. We're shooting it the way you guys would shoot it, and this has happened. So what we plan on doing is uh, we plan on replacing the firing pin, and we called Arrow Precision to see we did this all anonymously because we don't want any sort of special treatment uh, with the upper receiver specifically. Uh, because we want this to be an actual customer sample like what you guys would be buying. So our guy who ordered this anonymously originally called Arrow just about an hour ago, said, hey, I've got a problem, firing pin broke, what do I have to do? And they said, send the bull carrier group back, we're gonna warranty the whole thing, we can't sell you or send you a firing pin on its own, and we're a month out from even getting you a bull carrier group that's warrantied. 
so that kind of sucks. Uh, so what we're going to do instead, because we don't want to send out the whole bolt carrier group, because this is pretty essential to the rest of the testing and shooting it suppressed, um, we're going to go purchase a firing pin from another source and add it, and then we're going to continue with the test and see what else on the rifle might fail. I'm also interested in seeing how the barrel does at 5,000 rounds once we get to the end and once we shoot suppressed, and it's possible something else will fail, maybe not a firing pin, and then we can chalk it up to, hey, the rifle had two failures uh, over the course of 5,000 rounds. This one over here, firing pin over here, and we'll have a little bit more data. So we're going to continue with a slight uh, change to the weapon, adding someone else's firing pin to the bolt carrier group, but we're going to keep the same bolt carrier group that's head spaced um, to this upper, and um, we're going to see what else happens. But um, very interesting nonetheless. All right, so we're back on the range. We uh, have a replacement firing pin uh, to throw into the bull carrier group that we got with the upper uh, when we purchased the arrow, um, what we did, we actually tried a couple uh, firing pins from Lantac just to see you know, if they would work and uh, they didn't seem to be working too well and we really wanted to use a firing pin. We didn't shoot anything, but we wanted to use a firing pin that was a little more conducive for this test. So we went out and bought an entirely new bolt from Arrow uh, since their warranty was gonna take a month, which is not acceptable with the production schedule we're on. So what we're gonna do is rather than throw this whole bolt into the gun, because this won't be headspace to the barrel, it won't be very good for the test, we're actually gonna harvest the firing pin out of this bolt, throw the rest away, just kidding, we'll throw it away, we'll put it in the armory, and then uh, we'll use the existing bolt carrier group we've been using for the last 2,600 rounds, whatever we're at, and we will continue on with the test. If this firing pin breaks at another 2,000 rounds, just like the one before it, uh, safe to say that there's a pretty consistent problem, but it may not, we'll see, but we're also going to start shooting suppressed pretty soon. So let's go ahead and swap this guy out and uh, get back to shooting. That's three on the close target with the RMR, running the offset with a reload, transitioning to the night force on 5X. Shooting headshots at around 40 meters, there's 30 meters, something like that. Make it a little easier. And we've got our three headshots, one in the A box, two in the mouth. But yeah, I'll take it.
So we just completed 320 rounds with this particular configuration, this uh, loadout. We're using the Night Force uh, two and a half to 10. I think it's the NXS, uh, something like that. I've had this scope for about five or six years. I've used it on all kinds of guns. Um, what I really like about it is it has uh, parallax adjustment, unlike the Voodoo one to 10, um, and a lot of those sort of LPBO type scopes out there. Um, one of the things I don't like so much about it is it is a, a second focal plane scope. So if I go to shoot on six power, my holds will be completely different than they are on 10. Um, but for uh, these 320 rounds that we shot, uh, I was on 10X for pretty much the entire time shooting up to 600 meters. So um, everything for this batch of rounds seemed to have been all right. Um, pretty big difference between the uh, Lake City ammo that I'm shooting and the M80. But we already know that, just looking at the groups on paper. Um, we did shoot today with no wind though, so it's kind of an unfair advantage for that particular round. So we're now gonna go group test the barrel at around, I think we're about 3,000 rounds now, um, to see what's going on with all three calibers and what happens when they're suppressed. So pretty cool stuff going on here. I do have an offset RMR uh, just because this is a two and a half. It's not really a one X scope. It is a little harder to shoot on, um, you know, up close real fast. So the offset um, RMR does help with that. I didn't do a whole lot of that, but you guys, you guys know what that looks like. Um, you don't need a whole lot of demos in that area. Um, the witness marks that I keep uh, applying after spray painting for the uh, barrel nut screw, uh, it keeps moving. Um, it's moved a couple clicks. You know, it's slowly loosening. I'm not a huge fan of that. That might be something that I need to, you know, if I were to permanently shoot this gun and use it, I'd actually want to get in there and lock tight it with something crazy or just torque it down, tighten it down more than it already is, uh, more than what they gave us from factory. Uh, so we'll have to check on that. Detents for the uh, bolt release, uh, those are fine. Um, nothing else has happened that we know of, notice, minus the firing pin uh, fiasco we've already had. Uh, the radiant charging handle has been a very nice addition and uh, the gun is running nicely. We lubed it a while ago, haven't lubed it since, and we're just gonna shoot it you know, until we really need to do that again. So let's go ahead and build out the next loadout and uh, really see what this gun can do with this uh, new setup. So this is going to be the final long range precision build. What we have is uh, the Night Force 2 to 20. Uh, I wanna say this is the NX, NX8 uh, on this gun. Now, this is a Night Force scope. And I know a lot of people when they hear the Night Force name, they immediately go crazy expensive, super expensive, no way I'll ever own that. Um, only like super crazed, uh, you know, long range people are gonna buy those and they just kinda leave it at that. But this is what I learned when I was uh, researching scopes for this project, because I was trying to find some more like budget, well not, not budget budget, like $300 Chinesium stuff, but scopes in the middle. Scopes in like the $900 range, $800 range that have that higher magnification. And what I was finding is there wasn't really any out there that weren't, you know, super long, like weird magnifications from weird companies like, you know, Nikon and people like that, uh, that are like, you know, three to 16 or something like that, that were in that sort of $900 range. What I found is it was either made in China for like 500, 600 bucks or 1900 for basically everything, 1800. So this scope I paid, I think 1900 for on a Euro optic. And the NXX uh, back over there that I just used um, was around, I think, 1800 back when I bought it, like five, six years ago, something like that. So, and then the Voodoo 1 to 10 is like 1900 bucks. So, like a lot of these scopes, these like higher end scopes, I mean, you kind of, after you go from the Chinesium area, jump straight to this more expensive sort of an area, um, including the SIGs and some of the other stuff. So, it is definitely something to think about when you are getting into long range, paying for good glass. Um, it's definitely a little more important than like your close range rifles where there are like budget red dot options that are not bad. Um, but I wouldn't do that with a scope uh, magnified glass that I'm using to take accurate shots at 600 meters. That's just not something I'm interested in doing. So when you're getting into this sort of thing, definitely factor in good optics, um, save up for those. In this case, this scope costs, uh, Quite a bit more than the gun. The gun was like $1,200. Scope's $1,900 with the Knight's Mount, with the thingy for the other thingies. Uh, definitely up there in the $2,000 area. So there's a couple other modifications we've now done because we really want to consumer test this weapon as much as we can. We have added a suppressor. This is the Surefire 7.62 RC2 full size. We also have the uh, 7.62 Mini, which I use on 300 blackouts and other guns like that. And the plan is to do the long range with this particular can. And then when we get into the uh, last configuration of this rifle with a red dot to do a bunch of speed shooting and 
rapid fire, high rate, you know, volume kind of stuff, we may run the short can and see how much of a difference it is. But we want to run the long can because what we want to check is how much accuracy benefit or how much accuracy improving occurs by attaching the suppressor. Because I've had that on different guns that weren't super accurate to begin with. I added a Surefire suppressor and it actually got like one MOA better, uh, which is something that Surefire, I've talked to Surefire about when I went and visited their factory that and on some guns, some calibers, and in some cases, the suppressor will actually make your gun more accurate. Not always, but can make it more accurate. So that'll be interesting to test and find out. We're gonna group test this. And then we've also added, because I know some of you guys are gonna say, hey, some of those misses that you got like at 400, 300 meters, you know, y'all don't know how much wind there is, but um, is because you have a mil spec trigger in the gun, you need to change it out to a lightened trigger. So we've done that. This is a Geisley SSAE um, that is a two-stage trigger. It's got a really nice refined, like two and a half uh, pound break once you get past that first wall, and um, so that's going to help some, refine some of that sight, some of that uh, you know input into the gun once we're shooting a little bit further. So we have that so that we can test a little more adequately, you know, the capability of this weapon. And then I went ahead and swapped back to the Magpul PRS stock uh, to go with this optic, so I can really set my length of pull and it's more uh, precision gun-esque anyway. So yeah, so it's going to be fun to check this out. I still have the RMR on here. Not sure how much I'm going to use it. Probably not at all. Um, it does still clear this, uh, this turret, which is really nice. Um, this one is absolutely giant. Uh, so yeah, so let's go ahead and group test this, see what it does with the suppressor so you guys have some information. This information is pretty cool. So we haven't shot this gun suppressed in a while, but when I first bought this rifle, that was a thing that I tested early on because I did shoot around, I think it was like 120 rounds, like in the first week I had this gun. So I shot some unsuppressed. I can't remember what scope I had on it. And then I shot a little bit suppressed with the Surefire three prong just to make sure, hey, will a gun cycle? Well, it does, it's still pretty overgassed. Um, now we've shot like 3000 rounds on the gun so far. So we'll see if anything's changed that would prohibit the gun from cycling now with the same can that I shot with months ago, um, but it should all be fine. Um, and then we'll, we have a, a, a JP Enterprises uh, buffer spring we may wanna buffer, their, their, their special buffer spring thing. We'll throw in there and potentially see um, what we can do with that. But um, this should be fine. I don't think the gun will blow up. Oh, failure to fire. Whoa! Ah, ah. Oh yeah, are you sure? Yep, I pulled the trigger. I felt oh, and yeah, heard. Oh yeah, I see it. It's just a, a thing. All right, go ahead and just put it out. Pull the cycle on really Yep. Yeah, that All right, so we've just completed another group test with this gun. Um, we had to you know, wait on some shooting uh, due to the wind. We were trying to shoot every round with minimal wind uh, just to try to eliminate a little bit of variable. Um, but we went ahead and did, we zeroed the gun with M80 suppressed with the Surefire 7.62 RC2. We shot a five round group with each, uh, each caliber or each round, so the Winchester, the Hornady, and the Lake City. Then we removed the suppressor, shot another five round group um, unsuppressed, and then we put the can back on and then we shot five rounds uh, with, with each caliber again. So we have a total of three different groups um, and we have some interesting stuff going on here, some of which I cannot explain. I, I don't understand this stuff. Uh, I know some people think I'm a, a gun for this. Um, I'm not. But uh, what we do see is the 7.62 RC2 on this particular gun does not seem to be making a huge improvement. Um, you might even be able to say it's actually making the accuracy worse, but that would require, I, I wanna do a little more testing on that. But our first group, which was uh, suppressed, um, we saw you know a fairly large group, which is what we have been seeing with the M80. Um, it's usually like a three or a four inch group, something like that. We have a flyer down here, um, but then when we unsuppressed, uh, the group obviously moved up because that's something that I've noticed uh, when I remove cans, the barrel kind of flexes upwards. Um, and this group is, uh, again, pretty consistent with uh, what we've been getting with our M80. Uh, it's like a three, three and a half MOA uh, type group, um, even at the start of when we were shooting this gun. And then when we threw the can back on, um, the group stabilized and is kind of in that four inch, four MOA um, sort of a group with that Winchester M80. So that's interesting. When we shot the Hornady 178, uh, group's not bad, actually very consistent with uh, 
what we've done with Hornady in the in the past, uh, shooting this gun. And then when we unsuppressed it, the group got really good, which is interesting, um, with like one little flyer down here. Uh, but, we, but we normally get like a two inch group, something like that. So this is like an inch and a half. And then when we put the cam back on, it actually opened up quite a bit. So um, fascinating. Don't know why, no idea. Um, we are lead sledding the gun. We're putting sandbags on it, zip tie the stock to the rear, trying to eliminate as much human error as possible. We have a two stage trigger now. We're shooting this on 10X, um, but there's still some some stuff, you know, we're eliminating a lot of input. There could still be some, some, some stuff, but uh, again, this is some data that's more than what, you know, a lot of people are out there uh, doing with their guns. When we came over to the, uh, the, the Lake City, the first group we shot suppressed is a little bigger than we normally see. When you remove the cannon shot, once again, it's a little bigger than we normally see. It could be, you know, that's a flyer. And then if it were tucked in here, we're looking at, you know, inch and a half. Um, our first group we shot with the Lake City ammo was really good. We had four of the rounds that were touching. Um, so it's very close kind of to what the Hornady's doing. And then when we put the can back on, uh, the group actually stayed about the same, unlike the Hornady. Um, it obviously moved a little bit. Um, that could be, you know, a number of factors. But I will say we were shooting this, we were shooting this uh, quick enough that the gun was not cooling all the way. So we're not getting cold bore shots, or we, I don't think we're getting cold bore shots. The can's still hot, the barrel's still hot. Uh, we did all this in about the course of an hour and a half. Um, so I don't think that's part of the equation uh, here. So interesting stuff. I'm gonna go ahead and make some adjustments uh, for my zero for M80 suppressed. And we're gonna get into shooting and then we're gonna reconfirm with the Hornady, shoot that suppressed, reconfirm with the M118s, actually take it out to distance and see what it's doing. Um, but it doesn't look like the barrel is getting fried yet. We'd have to compare it to the first groups that we shot. Um, so I think we're still good to go at like 3000 rounds. But we'll see what happens after this. Bad dates. Malfunction! So we just lubed the gun, full bolt, check it out. Josh looked at some stuff, we lubed everything to see, you know, if maybe that was causing all the incessant malfunctions. Uh, it's still over gas, bolt's moving too fast and uh, we're still getting the same problem. Was able to fire like seven rounds before we got one, which is better than we just got, um, but we still have some problems. So I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna throw in the GP Enterprise's silent capture spring for an AR-10. See what that's like suppressed. If that doesn't work, then we're gonna play with some Sprinko springs. Try to slow the gun down a little bit, it's su suppressed, and uh, keep going. But this gun is probably not the best suppressor host if you don't modify things back here is what it's looking like. So we did the heaviest, because this gun was already pretty punchy, and uh, we'll, see, uh, we'll see how it goes. Still shooting the M80. I'm gonna go ahead and hit, uh, hit the far target at 600. The wind's died down a little bit. Five mil. Just gonna hold center. Malfunction! Casing is backwards. Another bullet trying to go in. Malfunction! Same thing.
Oh, I, I literally fired and looked to see where it went and nothing came out. Ah! So, because we have an extra bolt and firing pin and everything else here, we have something to compare it to. So when this came out, we first of all noticed that our retaining pin for our extractor has sheared. It's broken. Now, the other thing that's interesting is there's a small spring right here, which goes inside of these two O-rings. There's one, there's two, and then we have a typical spring and a double spring. Some companies have been doing this for a little while. Well, this spring, the small one, popped out probably because this cam pin, not cam pin, this retaining pin sheared. So it was floating under our extractor and not allowing this extractor to act as designed. Couldn't get enough leverage. So that would explain why you were having so many stovepipes. But it must have happened, it must have happened when we started suppressing the gun. Yeah, and it was probably all that extra Today. back pressure and dwell time that was adding force. And just, now it, psh, yep. Okay. That probably didn't all just happen at once. There was probably a fracture Already. to begin with and just the extra force caused it to break, which allowed this to have movement, which allowed the spring to come out. Which made the gun malfunction. Which caused that problem. <laughs> So it's not just that springs are wearing out or that it's overgassed or undergassed, while that may have been something for us to play with with the JP. Right. Something broke. Again. That caused it, yeah, for a second time, inside of the bolt carrier group, which is the heart of the gun. It has to function and beat every single time you pull the trigger. So a very, very crucial part to the firearm broke again. Well, mm. I see. So after 3,093 rounds fired and two pretty major failures, we are calling the test. We are not gonna be able to get to 5,000 rounds. As much as I would like to shoot the gun a little bit more, uh, continue using the Night Force 2 to 20 on the gun, uh, throw an aim point on there and use a little mini suppressor, which was on the firing schedule, uh, we're not gonna be testing the gun any further. We've already had enough failures and we're already having some problems with even getting the gun to cycle with the stock uh, buffer spring combo, suppressed and unsuppressed. Uh, we're just gonna conclude the test right here. And there's a couple things I wanna reiterate. First off, uh, this is a single rifle test. Uh, if, this, if we were to use uh, 10 rifles for this test and shoot all 10 under the same firing schedule, under the same conditions, we would actually have much more data that is actionable than just using a single item. And that's something that we're hoping to do in the future. It's obviously much more expensive. It takes a lot more time. You have to have more shooters um, or just one shooter shooting every single rifle and yeah I'm, not, I'm never going to do that but uh, there is some way of doing it with 10 rifles that would give us more of that data and then the second point that is important to note is we don't believe that this rifle was a lemon uh, and the reason for this is when I first got this rifle I took it to the range and I fired it was like 100 rounds something like that just to see like hey is the gun functioning fine can I throw a suppressor on there will it somewhat cycle and I noticed then that yeah it will cycle but it's a very hard hitting gun um, and so in that 100 rounds I deduced, hey, the gun will cycle. It's not just a lemon out of the box. And then we also decided when we went into our first day of filming that if we had a major problem within that first uh, 800 rounds, 900 rounds, whatever that first day was, we would actually send the rifle back to Arrow and say, hey, this is the problem that we had. Is this out of the ordinary? Uh, what should we do to resolve this issue? And then we would go about buying another rifle anonymously uh, to uh, begin the test anew. But after we hit that 700 rounds, didn't have any major problems, we moved forward with the test and we decided we will publish whatever the result is. So we factored in two different mechanisms to help prevent this from being a lemon occurrence uh, so that you're getting you know, good information and valuable data. So with that out of the way, let's talk about our letter that we sent to Arrow. So after we conducted this test and we you know, shot all of our targets, we got our groups, we did three different group tests. Uh, we sent Aero Precision a, uh, an email letting them know some of our findings, some of the problems that we had, just so they had a little heads up into, hey, we're dropping this video and we didn't have we didn't have the best results with your product. And since then, we've had a couple phone calls with uh, staff over there, the engineering department. And then uh, today, I just got off the phone with the uh, CEO, Scott Dover, talking about some of the problems that we had, but also getting some insight into the background of their company, uh, some of the uh, future growth opportunity that they have, some of the product innovations, and some of the different, just background on this rifle in particular, and some very valuable information on AR-10s in general. Now, I can't disclose everything that we talked about. Some of it was, you know, behind, you know, some of that behind 
closed doors, you know, business stuff that they have. Um, but I did get a lot of clarity on this product in uh, particular and also in the company. And one thing that I think is really important to note is they were very willing and interested in talking with us. Uh, this is not something you often see in the firearms industry when a reviewer has a, a, a bad experience with a product. Uh, you often see uh, companies just shut down and uh, say, uh, your test was wrong, uh, you're wrong, our product is the best ever, it's perfect, we have no innovation needed. Um, but not so with Aero. They were actually interested in hearing from us and talking to us at great length and uh, even getting on the phone with the CEO and they're a, a large company with uh, 800 employees, uh, much larger than T-Rex. So that's something that I'm super grateful for being able to uh, spend that time with them and get extra information. Some of you might be wondering if in the process of talking to Aero, we plan on sending this rifle back. And the answer is yes, we would like to figure out a way to send this rifle back with the bolt carrier group, with the, sh the you know, the, the ruined firing pin for them to actually dive into, uh, take it to the lab and actually see what's going on with the rifle. But we have to figure out a way to make that equitable for both of our companies. Uh, there's some legal stuff surrounding some of that. Uh, Mac over at Military Arms has talked at great length about this in the process of sending back a, um, a damaged product to a company and some of the risk associated with that. Um, but the goal for this video at the beginning was to um, promote a product and hopefully uh, sh highlight you know areas where it can be improved because that is something that's very important to us here at T-Rex Arms is ensuring that you all have the uh, best quality product that's available on the market. So since that is our goal with this video, we are going to be working towards uh, getting this rifle sent back to Arrow uh, with the bolt carrier group so they can dive in, look at it and make some improvements uh, based on what they find or maybe it could just be deducing that this was a limit of some sort and maybe some uh, improvements may not need to be made. But based on our conversation, there are a couple little things that we've already talked about that they will be improving or looking into. And that's something that gives me um, a lot of confidence or a lot more confidence into how they're uh, addressing this video in general. One thing Aero did ask us about while we were on the call is what kind of maintenance schedule uh, this firearm was on during the test. And the answer is uh, we didn't have a maintenance schedule baked into the actual firing schedule. And there's a lot of different ways you could do this. One is every 1200 rounds, uh, you strip the entire gun, you do a check on everything, you see if anything's cracked or falling apart or screws are coming loose or maybe the gas rings on the bolt carrier group are wearing down. Uh, we, we didn't do any of that. And the reason for that is most of you as customers aren't gonna be doing that either. Uh, you're either going to be cleaning the gun every time you shoot it, which you don't need to do and we definitely don't do, or you're not going to clean the gun at all and all you're going to do is just lube the gun when it needs to, which is what we've done in this video, and you're not going to do any crazy maintenance to the firearm. So it's not something that we were trying to do with this video. It's not something we plan on doing for any of our other tests is just ripping the gun completely apart and then assembling it all back together uh, because that's a great way of potentially, depending on how far you go, uh, upsetting some of the uh, the tolerances and the assembly that the company has done, and that's not something that we wanted to do. So we're treating this rifle, again, like a consumer test. We're gonna shoot this the same way a lot of you guys, not all of you, but a lot of you guys would shoot the rifle and not be constantly taking the gun apart because 1,200 rounds, that would be uh, at least two uh, full maintenances, three maintenances um, for this test, and that wasn't something we were interested in doing. We were just gonna apply lube when we needed it, and that's what we did. So first off, let's talk about the bolt. So one thing that we knew going into this is AR-10s in general are a much more violent weapon um, as far as a platform goes. It's not like the AR-15 that is much more developed and there's like tolerances and just uh, spec that is much more understood. AR-10s are a weird kind of an area when it comes to manufacturing. And it's something that we've been researching here is, hey, how can we build DMRs, like our own AR-10s here? And it's a little tricky finding all the parts, getting good parts and being able to do that. And that's why buying a, a gun out of the box that's already been off optimized for long range precision DMR stuff can be a huge benefit compared to buying a Air 15, a nice Air 15 out of the box. And in talking with Aero, uh, this is a part, the bolt carrier group specifically, uh, that they do source from another vendor. And what that means, as a manufacturing company, this is something we kind of know about here at T-Rex Arms, when you rely on a part or a bunch of components from another vendor that you don't make yourself, uh, there is an element of control that you just don't have. Now, you can still control the product and do a level of QC on that product. Uh, when you do receive it. And there is you know, that responsibility on Arrow or on us when we get nylon from a company that we outsource from someone else, that we ensure that that nylon is good to go and the plate carrier is not gonna fall apart, the plate's gonna fall right out. And there is a level of responsibility on Arrow for that as well with this bulk carrier group. But with that said, it also makes it a lot more tricky when 
this is coming from another vendor and there's a bunch of other parts on this that can fall apart or you know uh, wear out and it's not something they can just walk out onto the production floor and deal with uh, on the spot and keep that product super optimized. The other interesting thing to note though is if this is indeed a bolt carrier group from another vendor that maybe other companies are using, the same problems that we had with this bolt could manifest themselves with other companies' AR-10s. So it may not just be Aero. We're not going to know for sure. I don't know who all uses these bolts in other companies, um, but it is possible that the company that uh, is making this bolt carrier group um, with the firing pin that fell apart, um, you could actually see similar problems with the same companies using this specific bolt carrier group. So I do think that's important to notice um, and for you guys to know about. And it's something that Aero uh, was very willing for us to be able to share. And so that's pretty cool. With that said, the actual Aero parts that they make in-house fared pretty well for the test. Uh, we had some roll pins and some screws that started to kind of work their way out. And in talking to the guys over at Aero, uh, there is a reason that they do this on like the roll pin for the takedown, uh, the, the bolt release. And that is so that you guys, if you're swapping that out to an enlarged version, uh, can do that much more easily than, you know, uh, one of these little roll pin screw thingies having red or blue Loctite on it. Um, I can respect that decision. Uh, I think it's something that is, uh, you know, could be something that Arrow could tell people like, hey, this thing might fall out if you don't lock tight it. If you don't plan on replacing it with an oversized bolt catch, bolt release, uh, definitely add some Loctite to it. So I don't necessarily think, think that's a, a big defect with the gun. Um, and, I, and I respect that decision because I like to modify stuff uh, for sure. Um, so that is something that uh, was interesting. Uh, but overall, you know, the rail, the lower, the upper receiver, didn't have any big issues with that. It was really just the bolt carrier group. And those are all things that Arrow can actually manufacture in-house and control. And that's why we didn't see uh, a lot of problems or any problems uh, with those particular products. This next point is gonna probably be the one that you guys are gonna debate the most. And that's our expectation uh, of shooting this gun suppressed. Now it's important to note that we only shot this gun with 140 rounds suppressed before we started having more problems with the bolt carrier group. And before we even had the gun not even cycling. Well, it was when we started shooting suppressed. And the reason for this is uh, if you're buying a DMR or a battle rifle for the purpose of the second amendment, I think it's a good idea for you to have a suppressor on that gun. I think the, uh, the great grand thumb actually said that uh, suppressors will save your life. So for us, when we're looking at a product to test, Unless that product is explicit, you know, explicitly stated on the website that, hey, this product is not intended for suppressed shooting. Uh, go buy this instead, or do this upgrade, add an adjustable gas block. Um, we're gonna try to run it suppressed. Um, if it is not stated that it cannot be run suppressed, we're gonna put a suppressor on that sucker and we're gonna see what happens. So the argument could be made, hey, this upper was not intended for that, wasn't built for that, so you shouldn't expect it to survive 1,500 rounds of suppressed use, which is what our original plan was. We didn't even get there, we only shot 14, you know, 140 rounds. Um, so that is something to uh, think about, but for us, our standard here at T-Rex Arms is the rifles that we will be testing are rifles that should be able to accommodate suppressors because suppressors are a um, pretty big force multiplier. And it's something that I do believe firearms manufacturers should be taking into account, whether saying, yes, you can suppress our gun or no, don't suppress this model. Go get this one over here. So I know some of you guys are probably gonna debate in the comments that we shouldn't have you know, expected to be able to shoot suppressed. Um, but I think it's actually something that more firearms manufacturers need to be leaning into because suppressor ownership is going through the roof. Even with some of the NFA tax stamp stuff taking a very long time right now, um, there are a lot of people getting into suppressors because they understand how important and vital they can be to an actual fighting rifle. Now, as far as the accuracy of the gun, uh, the barrel is made by Ballistic Advantage, a sister company or an owned company by Aero Precision, which is pretty cool that they uh, acquired a barrel company uh, that really goes hand in hand. Great business decision, by the way. Um, they have a, uh, a one MOA guarantee or a sub MOA guarantee with match ammo. It's important to note because you're not going to get that out of like some crazy, you know, training ammo out of a European country or something. Um, but even the guarantee, it's hovering pretty close. Um, now, with that said, when we shot the three different groups and tested the three different groups, we used different optics, which can add a little bit of uh, room for air. Uh, we used the EOTech, uh, we used the Tango 60, so we were shooting that on 6X, and then we used the Night Force 2 to 20 at the end. Uh, so, arguably, using the magnified optics would uh, make the group a little bit more realistic, a little bit more accurate than running the EOTech at 100 meters. Um, but the, the overall data that we have here, uh, if you're looking at the sheet, is uh, the barrel started to degrade at 3,000 rounds uh, shooting the M80 ball. And that was unsuppressed. Uh, we could see the group going from a 3.8 inches uh, at the very beginning of the test, opening all the way up to 6.5. 
Now that's not great, although it really comes down to what your expectation is on a DMR. If you're okay, or battle rifle I should say, if you're okay with a three inch group at 100 meters with M80 ball, a relatively inexpensive ammo, then uh, the gun's gonna do exactly what you, or at least this one that I had, uh, is gonna do what you expect. If you expect this gun to give you sub MOA accuracy on all ammo types out there at all times up to 5,000 rounds, uh, that's not gonna happen. In fact, that's probably not gonna happen with any firearm out there on the market right now. Um, um, this is something just we're learning more about as we group test all the guns here in the armory. Uh, guns are not as accurate as people think they are. Um, and there's some pretty interesting ones in here that are uh, high-end guns that are not grouping as well as others. So, uh, but going back to the group testing, when we shot this with the Lake City ammo, the M118, the nice ammo, the $2.50 a round ammo, uh, we were getting a one inch group, a 1.1 inch group, and then at the end it went up to like a two inch group, um, shooting that ammo at 100 meters. And that's not, that's not horrible, it's not bad, it's, it's not necessarily one MOA, it's right on the line, teetering right there. Um, but I was able to take this gun reliably out to distance, out to 600 meters, when I was shooting that ammo, I was confident getting up on top of the box, going prone, using a bipod, and sending it into a uh, full-size steel target. Even shooting the MOA size targets, or uh, eight inch targets at like 500 meters, um, wasn't that much of a problem. I was able to get those hits. When I was shooting M80 ball though, that was not happening. It, I would, would have a good side picture, I would be in a stable position, I would have a good trigger press, my reticle would be in the exact right place, and the round would land way over here or over here and it would just mortar around the target and that's just due to uh, the inaccuracy of the ammo combined with this barrel at that distance and that was with no wind so we didn't have any wind to add into account and uh, we're just mortaring all around the target and uh, this is why uh, good ammo and actually grouping your barrel is super important and why if you're building out or planning on building out a DMR or a precision type rifle, having a high quality barrel that will give you that good accuracy with that particular ammo is super important. So the accuracy in the barrel, it was good, but again, it really comes down to your expectation. I don't know how good this is compared to some other guns out there, uh, but it is data for you guys to look at and make an assessment based on uh, what you are looking for in a battle rifle or DMR. And with that said, it's important to note, this is just one sample. It's possible that the, uh, the AR-10 that you have from Arrow is shooting a better group with a different kind of ammo. It is very possible because uh, accuracy in ammo and barrels, it's a very weird mix. I don't fully understand it. I think it's magic, but there's a lot of weird variables going on there. And so it is possible that you have one of these guns that is way more accurate than the one that we have. But here's the data so you can look at it and uh, make an assessment on your own. So after all this, would I recommend this rifle? Well, as a fun 308, uh, get your dip your toes in the water, sort of a gun, shooting you know, somewhat close, maybe a little bit far. Uh, yes, I think this is actually a great gun to start shooting 308 and learn DMRs in general. As a battle rifle or a DMR that you really wanna you know, trust your life to or uh, use for uh, certain kinds of operations or something, Probably not. I would probably lean towards a gun that's a little bit more reliable, a gun that can actually shoot suppressed uh, much more reliably, uh, rather shooting uh, or buying this particular gun. Now you could take this gun, and this is something that I will applaud Arrow for. Arrow does make a very big priority in uh, supporting builders out there by selling individual parts and even bringing individual parts to the market that originally were not there for AR-10 builders. Um, so technically I could take this gun, I could swap out the gas block to an adjustable, I could play with the buffers and the springs, and I could do all kinds of things to this gun, but at that point, I could just go buy a more optimized DMR rifle from another company for like $2,000 or $2,500. And that's probably the direction that I would go versus tinkering with this gun and making little adjustments here and there to turn the gun into what I needed to do. I would prefer just going out and buying a gun that's already done that's optimized for that. Um, but you could do that. You could try to, you know, modify the gun and, and be an AR builder and modify it as you go. And that would be an option. Um, but as it sits right now, it's not really a gun that I would recommend for precision shooting or DMR uh, type work. I would go with something else. Um, but the gun, uh, I was able to run and gun with it pretty well um, and shoot to distance and get hits uh, with a rifle that is around $1,200. And that is impressive uh, that I was able to do that, but I would lean towards buying a different DMR uh, for that purpose or even a battle rifle for that purpose as well. Personally, I really like Aero Precision. I, I've said this a lot of times, uh, the T-Rex rifle that we've recommended for a very long time has been a BCM upper, as we, BCM's just a great company to go with, on an Aero lower. Aero lowers are almost always in stock, which I think is something that is uh, extremely important, especially when uh, times get uh, a little spicy, 
Usually it's in a four year increment and, and people wanna buy a bunch of guns for some weird reason. Uh, Arrow is one of the few companies out there that actually maintains stock and restocks their product on a regular basis. I just bought an AR lower uh, literally like two days ago because I'm building out an interesting gun for a YouTube video coming up. Uh, not a full Arrow gun, but I wanted an Arrow lower because it's just, it's easy, it's simple, um, it's cost effective and they work really well. So we have like 20 or 30 Arrow lowers in here, some of which have uh, full auto. Uh, three hole uh, type stuff in them, but we've got arrow lowers all over the place and those are still the lowers that I'm gonna be recommending to people for a very long time. It would take some drastic thing to occur with arrow for me not to recommend those. But as far as this 308, you know, uh, a little different story. This could use a little bit of improvement maybe, or just a little bit more clarity given by arrow on what this gun is intended for. But we're big fans of arrow and even our communication with them uh, the past few days, has made me appreciate uh, their company much more, actually hearing a little bit more about how they're doing things and why they're doing things, uh, the level of persecution they're under in their state by the government, not being able to potentially manufacture or sell certain equipment in the future. I mean, that's just a sucky situation to be in, especially being a large company that would be much harder to move out of that state so that they can keep making you know, freedom-oriented equipment. It's important to note that until we actually film another comparison video like this, another 5,000 rounds, or as far as we get, with another gun in this class, so another battle rifle, DMR, you know, 308 caliber gun, um, there's not a lot to compare to with this. You can look at the accuracy data and kind of compare it to what you've done with your own gun. Um, you can look at how many rounds we fired and maybe think about how many you fired through your gun and if you've had any similar problems. Um, but until we actually go out and test another firearm that's similar, like the SIG AR-10, or uh, like I think PSA makes one, or the Armalite or something like that, um, it's gonna be very hard to compare this to anything because there aren't other people testing guns exactly like we are, with no maintenance, with an aggressive firing schedule, changing out the loadouts every single time, uh, spray painting. Some of y'all might be upset that we spray painted it and how it will affect the test. Uh, it didn't affect the test, at least I don't think it did. Um, so that is something just to remember as you're you know, leveling an opinion on this particular rifle that there's nothing to compare to. And that was one thing we talked about was, hey, if we're doing this video, do we need to do it against another gun? Or can we just focus on this gun and then later do another one and then people can kind of compare back to. So the plan is to uh, eventually film another video, um, or hopefully soon, with another rifle in this class doing the exact same firing schedule, looking at the exact same kind of testing that we're doing, exact same ammo, and actually see if we can draw some conclusions as far as the comparison goes. Now until we do another test like this one, another 5,000 rounds through a similar rifle, another DMR battle rifle, 308 caliber gun, it's gonna be hard for you guys to make a comparison assessment and really know what this information means. I mean, obviously there's the bolt failure and you can kind of understand what that is, but even the accuracy, uh, all you might be able to do is compare what this gun is doing based on what we found and the gun that you own, whether that's an LWRC or an LMT or an SR25 or a PSA or whatever it happens to be. And during this process, I have uh, figured out why other YouTubers don't uh, generally produce videos like this. Uh, one, it's extremely expensive. It takes a lot of time. Uh, plus it has the potential, a uh, very strong potential of severing relationships with companies uh, based on your findings uh, when you get to publishing them. The easy thing to do for us would just be to only publish good results, good findings, which is often what you find bloggers and gun tubers doing. Um, but that's not something we're interested in doing because that's not always helpful to the community. At some point you need to know what the problems are or how bad things can really get so you can appreciate how good products can actually become. And if everything is good, nothing is good. So you might be wondering, how can T-Rex do more of these? Especially if you're someone who found this helpful. Well, money can help for sure, uh, but it's really the time thing. This, this, making these videos takes a lot of time, but I do wanna point out a couple things. And, and the first one is, uh, we don't earn any money on YouTube. Uh, none of our videos are monetized. Uh, we don't have ads or we don't have sponsors inside of the video. I'm not talking about Raid Shadow Legends or Blue Apron or Dollar Shape Club or anything like that. Um, and we're not paid by these companies to make these videos. Uh, Arrow did not approach us and ask us to make this video so that they could get a bunch of sales. Um, we we self-fund all of these videos. And just for a little data point for you guys to produce this video right here, we're estimating it cost around if not more, uh, around $50,000. Uh, and we're willing to do this because this is the kind of information and content that we are interested in bringing more to the community, more to the industry, but yes, it costs money and it takes time. So if you're interested in supporting our effort and doing more of this, uh, the first one is we need to hear that you all appreciated this or that you all are interested in this or what you all would like to see because we want to produce the content that you guys are actually interested in or that will actually help you all. And then if you're interested in supporting us monetarily, well, our business model is pretty simple. Go get kitted 
with the gear that you need from our website. So we kill two birds with one stone. Uh, you're able to support our company monetarily so that we can drop 50 grand on a video like this. Uh, but in the process, you guys can get kitted with uh, plate carriers or optics or holsters or whatever it happens to be. And that's how we're funding all of these videos is just through sale of our product. Uh, we have no intention of doing a bunch of uh, sponsorship stuff or uh, getting companies to pay for stuff. It's possible we could have companies sponsor the ammo maybe but i'm really not interested in doing that either we'll just self-fund the whole thing as long as you guys uh, gain benefit from it and continue to support us and with that said i am interested in pursuing more of these types of videos and we have a couple that we are working on but i'm particularly interested if you guys would be willing to leave in the comments below what gun or guns plural you would be interested in us producing a similar video on of, of testing 5,000 rounds or it could be something maybe a little bit different but I am gonna say don't ask for unobtainium guns I'm not interested in testing weird obscure European firearms that you guys can't own I'm interested in testing firearms or running them through you know comparisons through guns that are readily available that you guys can actually acquire and can actually own so it's probably going to be more uh, budget oriented equipment um, it could be something in the two thousand three thousand dollar range uh, but is you know prevalent something you can buy like all the time on gun broker or uh, at your local gun store uh, those are the kinds of products that we are particularly interested in testing not FS 2000s and Steyr, well, Steyr Augs are pretty easy to get, but just weird guns like that. We're not really interested in conducting this kind of money and testing on products that you guys can't even own. So leave a comment in the description if uh, there is a gun out there you would like to see more data on that there just isn't a lot of data on, and we will see what we can do. And like I say in pretty much every video, training is really what matters. But there is an aspect of there of having equipment will actually allow you to take that training and take that skill and actually make it work. You need equipment that can actually function, uh, that is accurate, that is reliable, uh, that will enable you to solve whatever problem happens to be in front of you. So until next time, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys soon.